did his undergraduate uh, studies in Perth uh, before moving on to a very well considered postdoc in Italy. If you must postdoc anywhere, I think that's a wonderful place to do it. Uh, returned to Australia, an Australian postdoctoral fellow, and then in very quick order uh, became a professor of physics and is currently a future fellow. Uh, this is a scheme for identifying um, outstanding young researchers and um, taking them away from teaching where they would do damage. Um, so he's uh, very kindly agreed to give us some lectures on metrology today, and without any further ado, welcome Larry. Thanks Andrew. Uh, so it's a great honour here to be here today, so I wanted to kick off, we've got quite a few slides to uh, get through, so um, uh, I was essentially, essentially given this task to, to talk on uh, the tonic based metrology, I, I shrunk down the title that I was given. And, uh, but I prefer the sort of subtitle I've given it, using light to rule. So in two senses, rule like let's be a leader, but also to rule like as in the sense of a meter rule. Um, okay, well what is this metrology thing? Metrology is the uh, science of measurement. Not frequently when you mention this to people in the general public or in, indeed to people in, in science, they think metrology is, is the study of weather or the study of meteors, which is of course the origin of where the word meteorology is, but it's in fact the science of measurement. Now that doesn't normally get people very excited, but it should, because without measurement, you know, science is virtually a religion. Essentially all the breakthrough is in, in science, and I'm going to give you some examples on the next couple of slides, are driven by better and better measurement and a, and a close consideration of the concept of noise. So I'll give you some examples of that. I mean, in fact, you know, you could, it's probably not too far a stretch to argue that all of our technological progress is, is based upon uh, precision measurement that gives you great control of the things that, that uh, uh, you're interested in controlling. So, measurement is clearly an important concept that just doesn't seem to get people excited. Here's some examples of breakthroughs in measurement that's really driven uh, uh, amazing advances in the academic world. And so, the first one of those that I've written up there is, 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 all, is a natural oscillator that exists in the universe and that's the orbit of Mercury around the Sun. And people had known for several hundred years that there was a slow precession of the orbit of Mercury, or the, in fact a slow precession of the point of closest approach of Mercury to the Sun. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they made very sensitive measurements of that almost 200 years ago. For those of you who know your history of physics, this was the key piece of evidence that convinced Einstein that his general theory of relativity was true because he could explain that, which couldn't be explained under Newtonian mechanics. And I've got another example, this more uh, recent uh, example, which is the measurements of the energy levels of hydrogen and also of the uh, characteristics of the electron. And basically, the, uh, the magnetic moment of the electron um, as well as uh, you can interpret these measurements of an electron orbiting around inside uh, a, a microwave cavity, you can, you can interpret those also as a measurement of the fine structure constant, or alpha as it's called. And people have done measurements now, the most, uh, close to the most sensitive measurements of any physical parameter of alpha to three parts in, in uh, 10 to the 13, and that's uh, work by Jerry Gabrielzi. And the references are written in, in small font underneath there if you download the slides later on. Interesting sort of work. The measurements of hydrogen goes to show like the amazing advances in measurement just over this century. Here's an example that comes from uh, Ted Hensch's group in Munich. Uh, the measurement of a, a particular transition of hydrogen from the ground state of hydrogen uh, to the to, from the 1S state from the ground state of hydrogen up to the 2S state. And you can see that just over the last uh, 60 years or so, the incredible increase in precision from parts in 10 to the 5 up to parts in 10 to the 15 uh, resolution and accuracy in the, in the measurement of that uh, energy difference at those two levels. And you can see that in fact at today's uh, accuracy, they've actually hit the limit that's imposed by the clocks which are used as the reference inside that measurement. But nonetheless, it's an amazing you know, ten, the factor of 10 to 10. And if they want to push on any further, this is going to require improvements in the uh, performance of the clocks that are there. And the other uh, very interesting result, and we'll talk about that, I think it's tomorrow, in the third, in the third time that I come to meet you, is these tests of whether the 
universal constants are in fact uh, constant in uh, time. So whether they're even sensibly called constants, whether they're actually got a time derivative. So people have made the most sensitive modern measurements of that using atomic clocks, and so I'll talk about that in connection uh, with the atomic clockwork. So there are also uh, um, a whole bunch of reasons measurement is important in technological society outside the academic world and uh, to sort of reflect the fact that I see that this conference is a, is a or this summer school is a, is a joint um, US uh, Australian uh, process I thought I'd pick an American uh, oriented example as well as an Australian example and so that one can point to two amazing examples of influence modern life that are sort of based around uh, a measurement precision and that would be the the GPS system, which is based on a bunch of atomic clocks orbiting in satellites around the Earth. Uh, but one can also look at something like the uh, Wi-Fi system, which it turns out to be an extremely um, complicated system of, of switching between you know, multiple sources and interferences. Uh, a very tricky thing that was developed in connection with radio astronomy in the CSIRO, and recently CSIRO uh, received a massive payout to do with uh, certain intellectual property issues in regard to Wi-Fi. And you can also think of things like medical imaging examples. All things where measurement really uh, revolutionised the normal world as well. So I'm going to give you a different sort of example now. I was going to talk to you about the deep water horizon. And let's think about the quality of measurement. So this is the, the oil rig that uh, collapsed in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, uh, that and, and the measurement. So, Here's a satellite picture of the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see the oil that's all over it. And so I went to Wikipedia and I took, took down the measurements of the outflow of oil from the, from the well as a function of time. And the first and the last point, the first point is uh, what uh, BP said the outflow of oil was, is something like a thousand barrels a day. And the last point on there is some secret internal memo which, says, which was released by Congress. And if you're interested, you should go and read the congressional documents regarding this. Um, uh, incident that a secret memo inside BP that said that it could be as bad as 100,000. Well, clearly that's an example of how measurement is really, really, uh, it's important and it's not been done at all well. So there was a secret in all of the things that I've shown you that maybe is not apparent to you, that all of the things I showed you that were amazingly good measurements have actually been based on an oscillator, whether a natural oscillator like mercury or some artificial oscillator like an atomic clock, whereas my example of the, of the leaking oil in the Gulf of Mexico, of course, doesn't rely on an oscillator at all, the measurement's really bad. So, so, as we go through, I hope I can prove to you that if you really want to make a measurement with great precision, you should uh, base the whole system on some sort of oscillating process. So, uh, before we, we kick off, I thought that I'd, I'd give a real undergraduate slide about the concept of precision and accuracy, just so that we're all on the same page. So, the concept of precision and accuracy, essentially precision is, uh, is a statement that when we make a measurement of some physical quantity that's unchanging, we should get the same answer each time. But it makes no statement about how close to truth, in inverted commas, that measurement might be. And by truth, what I mean is that there's a bunch of agreed standards for the SI system, and we need to get an answer that agrees with that, with that uh, unified system if we're going to claim that the measurement is accurate. And so you can see that the concept of the target up here is supposed to imply that, that the, the measurement of the, in the top target is a precise measurement because we've got repeatability. The measurement in the lower uh, target indicates we've got uh, high accuracy because the average of all of those points lands in the, in the center of the target, but low precision measurement. So how do we go about making a good measurement? Well, I'm going to write down this slide, which is my sort of philosophy for how you go about making any measurement, really. We have something that we're interested in, some physical parameter that we're interested in measuring. What we need to do is convert it into something that we can actually measure, that we've got instruments that measure. So there's some conversion process to some measurable parameter. And then what we do is we compare that measurable parameter to something else, which comes from some sort of stable reference. So that could be some voltage standard or temperature standard or something else. So we need a device, well, first of all we need this stable reference and we also need a device that allows us to compare the physical, uh, the converted physical parameter to our stable reference. Okay, and then we end up with a, 
a nice measure. So here's an example. Let's say we want to make a measurement of an unknown voltage, for example, which is shown in the red blocks up there, and we've got some adjustable known voltage which is connected to some voltage reference, for example, and we have some sort of detector that can detect the voltage difference as well. So well, maybe one way to do the measurement in a nice way is shown in the bottom part of the slide. So here I have my unknown voltage, this Vx on the, on the left hand side, and on the right hand side I've got some sort of source voltage. And if I want to do it in a nice way, a way that all of the imperfections of real voltage sources don't matter, then I might do something like this null measurement where I use a resistance divider on the right hand side to take some sort of known ratio of my source and then I compare it to the voltage on the left hand side with something called the null detector which just essentially determines which one's greater or less than the other one. And the advantage of doing that with this null detection method is that I don't have to worry about my detector being linear or accurate. It's just going to give me a statement that the two things are the same or not the same. Well that's all well and good but in the real world, you know, real voltage sources have temperature uh, uh, problems. My null detector has probably got some voltage offset in it, so it's going to be an imperfect type of measurement. How can we make an even better measurement? What's well, a really smart way to make a measurement? And uh, my thesis to you is that we do this. So it's my same philosophy diagram, but I sort of put some different things in my box. So I've got some physical parameter that I'm interested in measuring, and what I do is I convert that to a frequency, and then my stable reference on the right hand side becomes a plot. And essentially my comparison between this frequency, which represents my physical parameter of interest, and my plot are compared by basically doing a count, where I just essentially count uh, cycles of one in terms of the others. And uh, why do I claim that that's a much better way of doing measurement? Well, the reason why I claim that is that essentially when I count, I can do that without error as long as I just count for longer and longer. And furthermore, if I do it this way, then my, my reference source is a clock. And as we'll see throughout like this, these lectures and the, and the ones tomorrow, clocks are the most stable thing that uh, humans have ever created. They're much more immune to any environmental perturbations than, than any other thing like a voltage source or a meter rule, for example, or, or a standard kilogram. So we have clocks that have got you know, stability on a scale, or stability is the right word, I guess, reproducibility on a, on a scale of parts in 10 to the 15 or 16, and that's, that's I believe, say, eight orders of magnitude more stable than, for example, the best uh, lump of metal you can make to make the mass standard. And uh, since we can do the comparison between our reference source and the thing that we're interested in with this counting technique, and we can do that essentially uh, perfectly precisely given that we're willing to wait long enough, then uh, then it seems to me that's a very good way to go about making a measure. And so that's really where we'll, we'll concentrate on this uh, photonic metrology techniques, using oscillators to make precision measurements. And those oscillators might be, might well be atomic clocks, for example, or, or, or uh, fabric pro cavities or something. But essentially the basis will always be using some sort of oscillation to make a measure. Well, I wanted to test you all on whether you could all do the frequency uh, comparison. So what I've got is I've got a frequency reference in here that's going at high speed and I've got some measurement and I'm going to play it, play it for you and I want you to tell me what the frequency ratio between the two is. Anybody want to shout out what it is? The ratio between those two. No, not, not between the frequencies. Between the, between the just the beat rates. You know? One to three is the correct answer. So people are feeling good that they got it. Now you can do this one. Oh, nothing. Who's musical? One to thirteen. I know. If I tell you it's three to five, does that help? I don't know. If you think about it for a while, maybe it is three to five. Alright, that's an aside. You're obviously not very good frequency counters, but you know, if we do it electronically, we can do a really good job. Um, okay, so if you accept my argument that, that frequency, measuring frequency or using oscillators to make measurements is a really 
good way to go. Then, um, then my, uh, then I think we, we need to think about first of all like these these stable things and the unstable things that I need to to use to make this measurement. So the first thing I need to do is build a sensor, a device that's going to convert the thing that I'm interested in, whether it's temperature or pressure or length, into a frequency. That's going to be my sensor, and then I'm also going to think about something which is essentially an anti-sensor or a non-sensor, a device which, whatever physical changes I make in its environment, it will just give exactly the same frequency, and that's something we call a clock, because uh, that's really what we mean. In addition, if it's going to be a good measurement, then we want those two devices, my sensor and my anti-sensor, to have very low noise, meaning that they don't fluctuate um, if the environment is not changing. In either case. Okay, furthermore, we've got to think about a means for which we can characterise the fluctuations in each of those. And we've got to think about a means to compare our sensor and our reference. And uh, mostly that's what we're going to talk about in this first uh, 40 minutes, is to talk about um, the means to do the comparison and the means to characterise the noise in these things. So, in other words, what defines a good clock? How do we measure the performance of a good clock? And how good are modern clocks are the sort of three things we're going to think about today. And uh, tomorrow we're going to, to think more about atomic clocks in, in particular as one example. So uh, one other thing about nomenclature that we need to think about is um, what are the difference between these terms, clocks, oscillators and frequency standards, which I keep using, and I actually use them interchangeably like everybody else in my field. And I tried to think about what it actually mean, and you can't really find a definition anywhere, so I've come up with these Andre definitions, but you know, take it, take it as read that I'm an Australian, so that means all the definitions are used loosely in normal conversation. But really, something like this is what people mean by the difference between those. An oscillator is just something that's got like some repetitively changing uh, phenomena, and hopefully it's, it's relatively stable in time. That oscillation frequency doesn't change with time. And if it, if it did that, then you probably call it a frequency standard. A time standard has two things in addition to being a frequency standard, and that's essentially that, that you need to be able to count up the cycles. Like, essentially, that's what the hands on a clock do. You know, they count up the cycles of the internal oscillator, so you need to be able to do that if it's going to be, pretend to be a time standard. And in addition, you probably want it to be, in some way, its internal frequency to be comparable to the definition of the SI second, so that it actually reads out something that's uh, sensible in relation to time. So, so, uh, and the final thing is a clock is some, a device that's got all those things previously, but in addition, essentially, you can set the time to be uh, at some agreed, you know, that right now is exactly whatever it is, 2.15 or something. Like, so we need to be able to set the epoch of the clock as well. Nonetheless, as you'll hear as I go through talking in, um, throughout this, I'll, I'll be loose with the language, but those are really the, probably the correct definitions. Essentially, this clock is a lot more uh, visceral than frequency standard or time standard. Okay, so here's a, here's a plot of clocks through time, which starts to give you some motivation as to why people are interested in it. So back in historical times, like 600 years ago, we've got something like just only water and sand clocks and this thing, a device called a verge and folio, which was a which is something that you can still find in very old cathedrals in Europe, which has not actually got an oscillator inside it, but it uses friction as a, as a regulating device. And these things have accuracies in the scale of like 1%. But you can see from the point around 1700 with the work of Huygens and uh, Harrison, that essentially there was this huge leap in performance, but really it's gone mad since the beginning of this century with the development of quartz oscillators and then atomic oscillators. In fact, it's 10 orders of magnitude improvement in the performance of clocks in the last 100 years. So uh, if we use our clock as a reference, and we've got a nice low noise sensor in the system as well, and this accuracy or this, this reproducibility of the clock really sets the ultimate precision of the measurement. So if you've got a clock with parts in 10 to the 16 performance, it means you can make a measurement of some other parameter, potentially of that same parts in 10 to the 16. Okay, so now we want to go and look in a little bit more detail about how exactly we're going to characterise the noise of these clocks. And this is sort of an outline to motivate you for, for listening to me for the next five minutes about noise and noise types. Because as I find, you know, scientists 
physicists are not ever, you know, very interested in noise. They think it's a boring subject, which I find sort of quite interesting because people are really interested in signals. And really what they should be interested in is, is if they're trying to make a quick measure of the signal to noise ratio, right? And, and frequently I find in the lab that it's relatively easy to get good quality signals. The problem is that they always come along with a whole bunch of noise and the problem is really to get rid of the noise. So although it superficially might seem to you before you get into the lab that the noise is, noise is somewhat boring, if you want to make a good measure, a good signal, then you need to consider noise. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But as we go on in the third lecture, we're going to start talking about atomic clocks and things like that. And once you've got the tools of this way to consider noise, uh, I'm hoping that will motivate you to go through this little bit. Um, and we'll also talk about where we can get in the ultimate limit. Okay, so here's a plot that sort of uh, um, essentially summarizes. Uh, noise types that are flipped, really measurements in general, or, or uh, oscillators in particular, we tend to find these sources all the time. So, you know, noise doesn't come in one type. The one that people frequently want to talk about is white noise, noise which has the same uh, intensity at uh, every little frequency interval wherever we choose it on the frequency axis. And so, I've shown you a picture of what it looks in the time domain on the left-hand side up there, and uh, schematically on the right-hand side, the spectral density of this noise is the same at all frequencies, so we'll see a flat, a flat spectrum. But it's more, you know, it's, it's equally common in real life to find other types of noise, noise that doesn't have uh, um, a uniform spectrum like that. So, for example, one that's a ubiquitous phenomena and, and still the source of interest to lots of people is this concept of pink noise or flicker noise or 1 over F noise, it's got three names which I've shown you a picture of what it typically looks like on the left-hand side. It's noise which has some correlation. The value that I obtain at this time does depend in some way on what happened in the, uh, at, the, at the previous instant. It has some memory in the system. Whereas white noise has no correlation. The, the value you get at the next instant is completely independent of what you got previously. Uh, and this flicker noise has the characteristic that in, in each decade of, of spectrum has exactly the same amount of energy. Uh, another frequent noise type we see is so-called uh, brown noise. Oh, I didn't know that. I found that on Wikipedia. Or, or noise, which is random walk. The reason it's called brown noise is because essentially if you look at a, a, a system which has got brownian noise in it, you basically find this a random walk with time. And so I've shown you that on the left-hand side. And that's got the spectrum that looks like falls as 1 over f squared. It's got even more memory in the previous system. It's more likely than 1 over f noise that you'll retain the previous value. And finally, there's something like drift, which I put down at the bottom here, which looks drifty. It's not really drift, but uh, you know, drift would be perhaps a, just a constant uh, ramp, but it's somewhere close to that. Um, and that's going to spectrum of 1 over f to the fourth. Now, why do I show you those? It turns out that when you make measure oscillator noises, you always get a combination of all those noises which dominate in different decades. And uh, we'll see that as we go along. So that's why I flag it for you to, to define all that. Okay, well, how do these um, noise sources manifest themselves in the output of the oscillator? And there's lots of ways they can come, come out. So here I've shown you a plot of, let's say, some random thing like blue sine wave varying the signal frequency being moved around. And the general equation for any oscillator is given at the bottom of the slide that essentially there's some amplitude that's oscillating out which I could have some sort of time varying value, so I've written that the amplitude is plus some little fluctuation, which is a function of time. Um, and then there's some sinusoidal term, which has a frequency, which could be a function of time, as well as a phase, which is a function of time. And all of those parameters could be varying independently and with being modulated with the various uh, noise types that I just showed you previously. And so there's a whole sort of profusion of ways that one can characterise the way that an oscillator fluctuates. And uh, the ways you could do it is just to basically look at the spectrum of the whole function. So I could just take the Fourier transform of the thing that's given up at the top there, the blue trace. And if I look at the, the Fourier transform, the, power of the, the square root of Fourier transform, the power spectral density of the, of the trace at the top, I'm essentially looking at the line width of my oscillator a concept that's frequently used in photonics. 
And I'm going to argue in the next few minutes that libel is a bad concept and we shouldn't use it, even though I'm guilty of using it myself. But we shouldn't use it because it's very incomplete. It's too o'clock. Yeah, good to know. <laughs> good to know. And one time. So the uh, so here's here, but there's another alternative, and this is the way that we frequently do it in my lab, and I think that there's a lot more power in this technique, is don't look at the Fourier spectrum of the actual trace, the function itself, but look at the Fourier transform of the actual modulating uh, quantity. So the phase noise, the frequency noise, and the amplitude noise. Look directly at the power spectral density those modulating functions themselves because they contain all of the information that you really need to fix the oscillator so that it becomes an ideal sine wave or a very narrow line and signal. And uh, I'm going to basically on the next few slides I'm going to argue what's the relationship between the power spectral density of the underlying modulating functions and the, and the power spectral density of the overall function and I'm also going to uh, uh, tell you what it basically looks like in, in those various cases. So, Let's go, go ahead and have a look at that. So here are, here are some typical noises that you might note in, the, in an oscillator output. So what I've shown you in the, in the panel on the top left hand side is amplitude modulation and it's white noise. So that's uh, why you can see it looks all jaggedy, it's got no memory in there. And you can see that basically you see a, a sinusoid that's got enhanced you know, fluctuations when it's well away from zero because essentially the fluctuation is in the amplitude. I've shown you white phase noise in the, in the lower left hand side where we see the fluctuations are largest as it's crossing zero because essentially that's where the, the value of the function is changing. And also show you some frequency modulation at a relatively low rate in the, in the, in the bottom right hand panel. So what I could do is just take the Fourier transform of the, the function that I'm showing you there, the red function, and that would give me the what's called the field spectrum of the oscillator. And I find that my field spectrum wasn't a delta function like we all dream of, but in fact has a whole bunch of sidebands on the side. Or I could look at the actual underlying function that's causing the phase modulation, the amplitude modulation, or the frequency modulation. And that's, I think, a much more powerful technique and uh, what I want to tell you about. And to do that, we've got to look at a little bit of modulation theory. So I think this is the sort of the only maths that we're going to come across in, in, in this. So bear with me and then I'll give you a graphical uh, uh, look at this modulation. So at the top, at the top of, the, of the slide I've basically written down an amplitude modulated signal. <coughs> you can see that the side over T on the end is essentially the carrier signal, the, the ideal thing that we're looking for, and I'm suggesting that there's an amplitude, a sinusoidal amplitude fluctuation of that signal, so it looks like 1 plus m sine and some modulation frequency in front of it. And if I just multiply that through and remember, strain my brain to remember the trig laws from when I was at high school with the product of the two sides, I can, I can actually just rewrite that as my carrier signal plus two sidebands that come along at the sum of difference frequencies. And so I've sort of shown you that graphically that the, the blue thing in the middle is the carrier, the desired information, and my modulation causes two sticks which are separated from my carrier by exactly the modulation frequency and the amplitude is determined by how much the fractional amplitude noise is. And then bottom half of the graph, I've shown you the same thing but this time not for amplitude modulation but for frequency modulation. So in this case I've got the sine of some sort of um, carrier, the omega t in there, plus there's some sinusoidal phase modulation buried in there as well. And I can expand that up too and I don't expect you to remember this. But it turns out that if you've got the sine of the sine, you can basically rewrite it in terms of a series of Bessel functions. And what it looks like is essentially a carrier with a, with a zero thought of Bessel function at the front, which would be equal to one if the modulation was, was zero, and then a whole bunch, a whole series, an infinite series of sidebands, which are all separated from the carrier by the modulation frequency, but they fall off in amplitude as, uh, as we come away. And in fact, if we have a small modulation, by that I mean less than a radian's worth of modulation, then the two amplitude modulation and frequency modulation basically look exactly the same, only the first sidebands exist. And it, it's essentially, they're down from the carrier by exactly the uh, amount of modulation. Well, there's an entirely different way to look at this whole function, and that's to look at it in a sort of phase on plot. And I'd like to show you that one. So, here's my... Um, Going. So instead of 
Instead of displaying it as a central carrier with two side bags, I can actually work in a frame which is co-rotating with my carrier and then display a phase as an angle on a circle. And uh, what we see then is instead the, the carrier sits basically uh, stationary along the um, x-axis there uh, and the two side bands are going either slightly slower or slightly faster than the carrier. And so we see the, the red one, the red side band rotating one way and the green side band, which are the lower and upper side bands, rotating around. And the sum of the, the constant carrier plus these other two side bands is causing, is causing, um, is causing the result to actually come in and out of the circle. And that corresponds to amplitude modulation because the length of the vector is fluctuating around. And I'm sort of plotting that out for you on the right hand panel here. I can also show you some what frequency modulation looks like there. And it turns out frequency modulation looks almost exactly the same as the amplitude modulation except I've rotated my two side bands around my 90 degrees and that causes my, my resultant to basically do an angle modulation with respect to this co-rotating frame with the carrier. So essentially I'm slightly slow or slightly fast, which is exactly what we mean by phase modulation. And I'm plotting out the phase modulation over right here. Okay, so maybe you can see that, that here's the relationship between, between the underlying modulation functions, which are these things that are buried inside here and here, and the result that ends up coming out what, what one might call the alignment. So if I do a, a phase modulation or an amplitude modulation, it's going to generate side bands which have an amplitude related to how fast I'm, well, the magnitude of it, but they have a separation of the rate that I'm doing that. And that's just as true for the noise functions as well as for amplitude functions. So for example, what I could look at is something like if I've got some fluctuating phase, I could consider the Fourier transform of the overall function as a result and I'd end up with something that typically looks like a, a stick that's got width. And this is what, what you know, people in laser spectroscopy would you know, could frequently think of as the line with the oscillator. We can generate that by making a beat between two different lasers, for example. But I would argue that this has much more power to actually look at the underlying um, phase fluctuations themselves. And it is true that there's a simple relationship between these phase fluctuations and the resultant field spectrum if the phase fluctuations are small. But it turns out that when you're using a laser, that's never true that the phase fluctuations are small compared to one radian. They're always very, very large compared to one radian, essentially because the period is short. And in that circumstance, essentially, uh, the, you can't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the line width and the actual phase noise spectrum. Okay. Um, perhaps just to emphasize to emphasise that point, um, I've, I've plotted this up on this side here. So here I have some phase modulation. Um, so there's a bright stick here as well as some sort of noise spectrum. This is the underlying phase, the power spectrum of the underlying phase fluctuations. And here's the resulting line, you know, the spectrum of the, the actual line width itself, if you like. And you can see it's got bright side bands on it. And the shape of this is exactly reminiscent of this, and so people would be happy. But with other types of phase modulation spectra, like white phase fluctuations, where we have a spectrum looking like this, the line width is a bit hard to see, but it just looks like a delta function with a high level of noise. So the line width of this, the red situation, would be zero. You'd think you've got a really great laser source, but in fact, the phase fluctuations are even worse. So I think the lesson to take home is that you really want to look at the underlying phase and amplitude noise. If you want to understand what's going on with the oscillator, and I'll show you some examples. Okay, so there's a second one, second thing that uh, uh, way that frequently one comes across in the literature for characterised fluctuations of oscillators. Instead of instead of using looking at the spectrum of the fluctuations, we can also work in the time domain, and this is frequently done if you want to look at, it, at the, the stability of an oscillator over the long term. So uh, here's an example of basically what we do. We might have some sort of fluctuating oscillation. And essentially we count zero crossings in a little window function here that's got some sort of duration tau. Um, and we might have two, four, three type zero crossings. Um, and I might do it at different uh, lengths of, uh, of windowing here. So a much longer time, three times longer over here and count zero crossings. And the so-called square root Allen variance or Allen frequency deviation is essentially to 
to look at the fluctuations in this time series that you generate uh, on various uh, integration times or gate times. So we might have a plot that looks something like this. We're generating these sort of various frequencies. And if I want to calculate the fluctuation in that series, we use this concept of square of variance, which is essentially to calculate the differences between adjacent points, which is what this means in sum and all up. Well, this is clearly very similar to how you calculate a normal variance. A normal variance would be just basically to calculate the difference of each point in the mean and sum up all those squares, rather than the differences between adjacent points. But it turns out that calculating normal variances of real time series that you get in nature is a very unstable phenomenon. And that's essentially because if there's drift in the system, if there's low frequency fluctuations compared to the length of your measurement, then essentially the mean keeps shifting, so you can't calculate the variance. So the square root L variance is a very powerful means of characterising fluctuations. And uh, to give you an example, here's a plot that, that sort of uh, tells you the square root L variance for all of the best clocks that either you can buy commercially or the best ones ever built. Um, as of, you know, a few months ago is the, the latest data in relation to all of that. So if I was to go and buy a, something like a quartz oscillator, $10,000, I'd see that the frequency fluctuations of the square root L variance between adjacent points are essentially at the level of a few parts in 10 to the 12, and uh, they're independent of whatever time scale I choose, which is the bottom axis here. So whether I use long uh, gate times, long integration times to examine the fluctuations, or short ones, I get the same answer. And uh, if I spend $50,000 on my quartz oscillator, it gets you know, an order of magnitude better, but we have the same characteristic fluctuations are independent of what time scale I choose. And that actually is a characteristic the oscillator is dominated by 1 over F noise in its spectrum, as you will see on the next slide. If I look at things like the best sort of atomic clocks that you can buy these days, they're even uh, better. These are sort of laboratory standards. So we have the cesium fountain, which is the best microwave frequency standard, which is the definition of the second in the globe, you know, down to these latest clocks based on ions trapped in, in RF traps, and these are sitting way down here. Nonetheless, all of these have this sort of characteristic slope of 1 over the square root of time. The longer I measure for, the measurement improves the square root of the measurement time. That's why they're sort of dropping downwards. And that's a characteristic of white noise, um, white frequency noise. And as we'll see, that's related to the way that the laser is actually locked to the atoms. Okay, so you can make up some table like this, which I don't intend you to, to understand, but essentially it's there if you want to look at it later on, which relates the, the spectrum of the phase fluctuations or the frequency fluctuations to the way that in the time frame the system fluctuates and basically is in accord with what I just said before. Um, okay, here's, a, here's an example, for example, uh, an example, for example. Here's an example of, of locking a laser to a, to a fabric grow cavity. So this is something we've done in the lab. The, uh, and I'm presenting here the fluctuations in the frequency over various time scales. So it's a spectral density of frequency fluctuations. And uh, the green shows the laser as it comes out of the box. And so you can see that it's dominated in the short term by this so-called 1 over F, this ubiquitous so-called flicker frequency noise. So white noise is not the most common thing you discover in, in the lab. In reality, you see this flicker noise always in electronics. And then at higher frequencies, it looks like 1 over f squared, which means a random walk, so it's drifting around. <laughs> if I took the Allen variance of this, then I'd find that basically it was independent of the time scale. And once we lock it up to our um, fabric grow cavity, we can suppress the noise in the short term here, and actually make it a bit worse than the high frequency band. And we can suppress it down to the limits of our locking system, which are white frequency noise, so we see new Allen variance. So, two minutes. Yep, all right. It's only 38 over here, Andrew. Oh, we did start late. Sure, we started late. Okay. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to point out is that this level of noise corresponds to something like a thousand radians worth of fluctuations in the short term. And so clearly if you go and examine the, the spectrum of this laser and try and interpret what's going on, you're not going to find out anything useful because uh, that exceeds this low phase noise uh, modulation and so there's spectral spillover in the whole thing. Well, to reward you from get, for getting this far in the talk to throw all that boring noise stuff, and before we can turn on to the interesting stuff, uh, I've got a little song for you.
short, ultra short pulses in time to basically make super precise frequency measurements, which is was the development of these optical frequency clones. And so now that you've got all the tools for understanding uh, noise, we're in a good position to understand that a little bit more deeply than we would have otherwise. So it's going to have a break. So that, that's the yep. plan, wasn't it? And okay. Thank you. Back in five minutes or